from HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan, announcing show number 182, recorded live Wednesday, September 30th, 2009. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik RAD Controls, the most comprehensive suite of components for Windows Forms and ASP.NET Web applications. Online at www.telerik.com. In this episode, Scott discusses the history and future of the web with instructor and web standards advocate Molly Holschlag. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman, and this is another episode of Hansel Minutes, and I am here in Monterrey, Mexico, and I have the pleasure of sitting down in person with Molly Holschlag from molly.com, the legend in person. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Scott. It's a pleasure to be here. Molly is a, a web evangelist around developer relations for the Opera browser at opera.com, and she's also the author of 35 books, including the very popular Zen of CSS Design. Molly has also a long-time relationship with the W3C standards body, including being on the CSS3 working group. Yes, so, the CSS working group, yes. Oh, the CSS working yes, group. Yes, we're working on CSS3 right so now. So you have a, a, a credentials as long as my arm around standards on the web. I've been involved for a long time, yes. And did you just fall into this one day? Yeah. You know, when I was growing up, it wasn't like there was an option to become a web developer. Yeah. <laughs> Mom, when I grow up, I want to be a web developer. We didn't have that. Um, so, yeah, it was just a matter of being in the right place at the right time and having gone to you know, a certain conference or something and somebody mm -hmm. going, oh, that HTML stuff. Oh, well, yeah, put Molly on it or... You know, right. so everything was a bit of a, everything that happened was sort of non, not planned, definitely not planned. And it's just been a, a wild ride, a very, you know, very wild, interesting ride to grow up with the web. And this started somewhere around 92? Well, I've been in IT. I've been in IT since about, um, uh, 88 or so, mm -hmm. something like that. So I started my career around then and I was already a technical writer. I was doing, um, other things, uh, getting into technology more and more and, and more of an interest in technology. And, you know, so I was around the internet, Usenet, Gopher back in the day, oh, yeah. Yeah, back in the day, BBS is all the way. Oh, totally. Yeah. So it was a really great time. And then of course, when the web came along and, and, you know, my first view of it was, you know, on the, on the line, mm -hmm. you know, on the line command, uh, command line there, uh, using, you know, an Apache server and Lynx browser and, checking out what this was all about, you know, see, so I, I have the, the great fortune to have been at the earliest point of the web's birth and, you know, have grown up with it. So, mm -hmm. um, I think that's part of the reason that, you know, it, it's been a highly productive career for me because there's just been so much cool stuff going on. But being there at the beginning, like when I, mean, I was there, uh, and you know, Genie and Prodigy and CompuServe Genie. and you know, yeah. all that good stuff. Yeah. Four uh, ninety five a month, all you could eat from oh, yeah. the hours of like six. And I ran a Wildcat or... BBS, but there's a difference awesome. between being there. Yeah, I had a multi line <laughs> Wildcat BBS. Wow. We did, a, we did a show with the creators of the Wildcat BBS. I system. am seriously impressed. Oh, they're very cool people. Uh, you should listen to that show. But that doesn't, that means I've been a user since day, day mm. zero. But, uh, there's a big difference between being a user and being interested in driving the direction of the way. Th when did you start pushing the direction things were going as opposed to just consuming? That's a very interesting question because I think it was, it's just in my nature. I've always been, um, you know, when I was a kid, I, you know, I was growing up and I was thinking about the Peace Corps as a future. I've always been, you know, a bit of a, of a, of a, let's get stuff done. You know, let's not just talk about it. Let's go and change the world. Mm -hmm. and it's sort of my personality. So I think it was inevitable that, that when the web came along, immediately I began to see it. Well, in fact, it was even before the web. I have to be honest, the moment that I really knew that, that, that I was going to be somehow significantly involved in a push forward in technology happened on Q-Link with my, with my Commodore 64 when I saw international chat for the first time. International, not yes, English not, chat. Not, yes. And it, it was people from around the world in, in pretty much real time. I mean, we're talking about 300 baud modems here, sure. but, but I mean, amazing. You know, I knew that this was the beginning. There was just some instinct in really? me. Yeah. So it suddenly was just it a was response. the Peace Corps with angle brackets. Yes, exactly. It was like, it was like, I could do the Peace Corps from my bedroom here, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I, and then, you know, of course that morphed into later becoming the web and becoming a huge opportunity, you know, to, to move things forward. And to take this a little further, I have my youngest brother, 
uh, always teases me. He says, uh, you were talking about the NPR and he says, you know, I'm the PBS or like the M- NPR of the web where right. NPR for our yes, international listeners is the national public, public radio, radio exactly. Or the PBS public broadcasting system. In other words, those, those systems that are of the people like the BBC, right? right. So, so, um, the idea being that, uh, that I've always had that attitude and that that was always, you know, my personality, I think. Mm-hmm. So the two just meshed right away. Um, and then I began to see as, you know, I've always had an interest in education and I began to see people really struggling and I got, you know, I began to teach web design classes and the more and more I got into that, I was offered a book deal. I got, you know, and the deeper I got, the deeper, you mm-hmm. know, the, the faster it went. You know, there's, it's interesting. There's a, uh, I, I, I work with the team that works at Microsoft Developer Network mm-hmm. and I was reading some research and they were talking about different kinds of personalities that exist on the on the web and in developer communities, and with with all of these kinds of research, they inevitably end up using uh, alliteration. And they had different kinds of people, and it was like critic, consumer, um, collector, and uh, there was one a collaborator. Right. And I put up a Twitter poll up, and I said, "Well, which one of these which personalities are you? <laughs> are you?" And I got a chastise for using radio buttons instead of check boxes. Because people wanted to be multiple personalities. <laughs> I think there is that. I mean, we are. We are not one thing, are we? Sure. But it sounds like a, a collaborator. I mean, you're bringing multiple people together. Absolutely. Um, actually, Tim Berners-Lee, the, the inventor of the World Wide Web, during one of our conversations at TPAC, got very excited. And actually, he used a Malcolm Gladwell um, name, which was uh, The Connector. Mm-hmm. So he uh-huh. says, "You're the connector. You're the connector. That's an, uh, one I of like the nicest that better things." Than collaborator. Yeah. Well, it's different. The collaborator collaborators collaborate um, in in work environments, and of course, now that I'm part of an actual team of people, whereas mm-hmm. I was independent from most of my career, uh, the collaboration factor is really important. But the connection factor, bringing people together, linking, this is part of the philosophy that emerged for me with the early web where I began to see very clearly that the link was a representative of human links as well. Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, this sounds a little, maybe a little off to to some, but it's not really. If you look at the writing and the, and the the discussions about with Tim Berners-Lee, a physicist, a brilliant physicist, a brilliant scientist, and and the inventor of the World Wide Web, we're not talking about, you know, we're talking about incredible here. You know, really. You got to give him some credit for that one small thing. thing That that one small thing that changed the world. Inventing the web and all. (laughs) Exactly. If he doesn't get a Nobel, I'm going to be surprised. He's already won the Japan prize. But, uh, that, that, that aside, he, his early writings were also sociological important. Mm-hmm. Um, he always saw the social aspect. And as time went on, you look at his writings and how he's become even more and more into that. Mm-hmm. So I don't think it's wrong, you know, to say that it's not me. It was there in the heart of the web already. Yeah. Uh, you know, because we're here at, in, at the Software Guru Conference in Mexico. And in both of our talks, we always inject the sense of the social web. My talk was about social networking for developers. And one of the questions that someone asked, which I thought was kind of an audacious question, was, uh, it may have been a joke, but they said, what is the future of social networking on the web? My first impression was, I am no more qualified to answer that question than than anyone. But the thing that really struck me was that it's changing fundamentally how we interact with people. I mean, do, do you ever have converse, like Let me give you a perfect example. As a, as a, as a professional speaker and a, and a collaborator and a, a connector, you're going all over the world. You very likely have had the experience where you have interacted with someone for months on a project, having never met them or shook Absolutely. their hand. Absolutely, yes. And then simply go, oh, and here we are in the same country or the same city. Yep. And you just keep talking. Exactly. The conversation it's, it's, it's moves fluid. seamlessly. In fact, in fact... I have years of experience like that, even back in the BBS days when we would do our GTs, our get togethers, yeah. where people would actually, you know, you'd have the, the multi- original tweet ups. Yep. The original tweet ups. And I think that, I think that it, 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 you said something in your session yesterday about, you know, the need, like you were making jokes about how, you know, most of us want to, uh, connect with people, but we don't necessarily want to do it with yeah. them. I, without I forget, the with, wetware. Without, part without, of yeah, it, exactly. Know? Without, <laughs> without having to actually be with people. <laughs> you know, we're always looking for ways to do that, which in a way, you know, it's obviously, um, your humor, but it, it it's a point. Um, there there are times that it's an opt in thing, and I really like that. I like the, the 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 fact that we have an entire social world that we can opt in or out of depending upon you know our mood or our needs, you mm-hmm. know, and that really is very cool. To answer a question like that though is is an impossibility. First mm-hmm. of all, anybody who's walking around with a crystal ball and says this is the future of the web, 
I'm I'm not going to believe them. And I would suggest to others that they think very carefully and listen yeah. carefully to what that person is saying and weigh it on their own measure. Because I don't think we can tell the future. We've already seen that as we think we know what the future is, what as we were talking about with XHTML, right, just yesterday, yes. suddenly something happens and the whole world changes. Right. Yesterday I said to you how proud I was that one of our websites uh, was validated as XHTML strict. And I kind of got you had that look on your face that kind of said, oh, welcome to last year. Yeah, welcome to 10 years ago. Well, yeah, there is <laughs> For that. some of us, for, for some of us. For some of you, that's yeah, true. Yeah, but actually, realistically, we do see a huge shift now technologically where XHTML2 is, is, has lost, at the end of this year, its charter is up, December 31st of this year, mm-hmm. and XHTML2 work will stop. And the W3C has made a very overt statement that, in fact, it is putting its energy toward HTML5, which is changing the ballgame completely. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're talking about absolutely shifting toward application mentality and software development right. as opposed to just, I shouldn't say that, it's just writing pages, but it's sure. no longer a document format only. But is, now forgive my ignorance. I'm going to ask some questions I know the answers to, but other ones I'm just purely ignorant about. And I'll let the listener, that's an exercise to the listener to figure out whether they have any idea okay. <laughs> if I'm completely clueless about this. But is HTML5 XML or is it SGML? Oh, wow. Okay. So... Um, there's a, there's a good answer for this. Let me, let me, um, explain. If we look at HTML5, there are, because of the XML, um, the fact that XML is so widely, widely used and so much, uh, uh X, everything at W3C pretty much outside of HTML and CSS is done in XML serialization. Mm-hmm. So HTML5 has a responsibility to be backward compatible. XHTML2, of course, this is one of the reasons that it probably, you know, ran into a dead end. Um, mm-hmm. part of the problem is, is it's not backward compatible with non XML, um, documentation so and mime typing so the thing is is that if you were running an xhtml2 document and delivering it as xml or application xml or xhtml you would actually not be able to have a, a, an older browser appear right. on they that would site it page. would either that or an error would be thrown it, mm. it's very very would you know i don't know how you know different um browser vendors would implement that but you know it, it just basically says this application can't run okay yeah. and your programming st- stops there. And that could be okay at a very high level of pro- production, but for for the democratic web it simply doesn't work. So the ideologies in HTML5 were not only to maintain that backward compatibility so that we always have the SGML and the HTML language, but to also be inclusive of XML syntax. Mm-hmm. So there are two ways that you can go about writing HTML5 mm-hmm. and you can do it in XML syntax Right. right or, so, I mean, meaning strict, well formed, well formed. Strict but, isn't the right word. I know. Well formed. Uh, well, yeah. Strict would be the uh, rigor, XML rigor. rigor okay. So that the you know every attribute value is quoted. Exactly. Uh, you use a Close trailing tag, slash. Yeah. You make sure that all your non-empty elements are closed. Exactly. Okay. All of the rules. But the if you are going to do XML there, you have to serve as XML. Okay application. Ah, I see. Okay, so when okay. we say serve as, one of the things that you've been talking about that we haven't called that explicitly is the importance of mime, mime types, types yes. which I think is one of the number one things that people ignore on the web. And and that ignorance that ignorance is 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 um becomes more of a problem when the more media types we get, right? The more the more we have needs there. So, I think in, in Internet Explorer really never implemented the MIME types for XHTML, which is right. one of the reasons that I think it's not Microsoft's fault. I mean, there was a general consensus yeah. among browser vendors that that XHTML was a non-starter, despite the fact that we learned a great deal. I think one of the things we learned was how to be better coders. We learned how to respect the rigor. Yeah. And my, one of my fears about HTML5 is that because in this other in this, in, in the notation, the HTML5 notation, if you're using SGML notation, or, well, both are SGML really. So if you're using the HTML notation versus the XML notation in HTML5, the sloppiness all comes back. Mm-hmm. If you want it to. You don't have to. Hey everybody, this is Scott coming at you from another place in time. No doubt you probably bump into testing tasks now and then in your work. And you know, writing functional tests is probably not your favorite thing. It's kind of difficult, takes time, and the results can be dubious. Well, get ready to start liking tests uh, thanks to Telerik with the uh, the new WebI testing framework. Building web automation tests is a breeze. You've got code automation with advanced ASP.NET AJAX and Serverlite applications. You can write a single test, have it executed against multiple browsers at once. 
You benefit from a rich API. There's link support, integration with Visual Studio unit testing, also NUnit, XUnit, and MBUnit, not to mention the free wrappers for Telerik RAD controls for ASP.NET, AJAX, and Silverlight, all shipping with Telerik's new testing tool. One of the best features, the WebI testing framework, which is developed by Art of Test, is it's absolutely free. If you've already got hooked on WebI testing framework, start using it right away. Go to Telerik.com for more info. Thanks a lot. So for the six of us that are listening that have actually followed this so far, <laughs> let's just do a real quick reset. Absolutely. To, to talk about. So SGML it has tags and elements that we're familiar with. It uses open open angle brackets, right? Except it's not required to close the tag. No, no. Let's go back a step. Okay, go back okay? farther. So SGML, the standard generalized markup language, was a language, a document management meta language that was created by in the 60s by a guy named Charles Goldfarb, who was a lawyer. So it's a huge spec. What it simply does is it basically cre- it basically has in it semantics that Tim Berners-Lee and his colleagues used to create HTML, which is a completely different, very, very simplistic um, for the web mm-hmm. um, markup language. So the parent of HTML, you know, HTML is a- an application mm-hmm. of SGML, or, okay. okay, a subset of. Um, XML is also an application of SGML. Okay. So it, it's like what we did is we went back in the W3C mm-hmm. and we reviewed the sloppiness and we reviewed the problems that we were finding mm-hmm. with that notation issue. And we said, okay, we want the XML rigor. XML okay. brings the strictness, this rigor back into, into, it makes it more of a, of a, a programmatic, you know, right. process. It's unforgiving on purpose. On purpose, right. Um, but still forgiving and in that it's HTML vocabulary. Right. So it, it's backward compatible, right? So as long as you're not delivering it as an XML application, that is going to be available to the masses for as long as browsers are capable right. of, you know, handling that. Um, so actually XML, when we look at XML itself, it, like its parent SGML, is also a meta language. In other words, we use its guidelines and its syntax to create other ontologies and languages. So HTML is just one of the vocabularies. Mm-hmm. HTML5 is, is, and it includes both of these vocabularies. Okay, so does that mean that H, so HTML5, I've got this, this, uh, taxonomy, this, this glossary of choices that I, different tags I can use, and I can choose to serve it in a less rigorous, uh, more SGML-like format where I don't necessarily close every tag, but I have a MIME type that explicitly declares my intent to do that, or I can uh, return HTML5 and use application forward slash XML indicating that I choose to opt into that rigor. Right. So either you are delivering your HTML5 document as an XML document, in which case you must be confined to that rigor, Mm -hmm. Or you are using HTML and you are sending it as text HTML. Right, text not HTML. Yeah, and that is, uh, and that does not require the rigor, which is a concern, a concern True. for me as an educator. I think we can still maintain good practice mm-hmm. um, and make sure we still, you know, when when you're working in cross document management, as, as I know you probably have done many times, it becomes a nightmare when you have everybody's different coding styles. Oh, everyone has away. written their HTML you tidy. Know? Yeah, exactly. But, but I want to get back to this, 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 the importance of the MIME type. Could you juxtapose that with doc type? Because it feels like the new web is putting much more import on MIME type. When it would have previously, I would have thought about doc types. Well, actually, do, there's a big mystique about, or a mystery, I think, uh, about doc types that probably would be good to demystify for the audience. Um, a doc type declaration is a piece of SGML that exists at the top of documents that are SGML. Or in the case of XML, you have an XML declaration followed by a doc type declaration. So it's both. So, um, Essentially, those declarations were passive. They were not meant to do anything but declare which uh, language and which language version you were using. And the only time that it would become active is when you instigated purposely validation. Okay, so you went to a validator or you used some validation tool. The doc type was then in, is used then used. This is still true today. Mm-hmm. The doc type then looks at the spec and compares what you say you're writing to mm-hmm. to the document and throws back errors or warnings based on what you have done or not done in that document. 
Okay. okay? So really, when we think about dog types, we're thinking about something that, that was very passive and was never meant to be what it does now. Um, in the IE process, when IE6 came along, um, there were, there was, uh, the implementation of the HTML box model, and there was also in, in the newer rendering in IE6 when it came out, very, very, you know, great CSS browser. It wouldn't have lasted five years if it, if it hadn't been. Sure. Um, but of course, five years is a long time to wait. But that aside, um, the, there was, in fact, in the Trident, the CSS ren, ren, box model rendering, and box model rendering is different. You just use different. the word Trident? Yes. You just use code names and things? Oh, I'm not supposed to do no, that. You can use them. Just make sure the listeners know what they Trident are. Trident is the, is the, is the ren, is the engine which, with it, the layout engine inside of IE. Right. Okay. And each, each, um, each browser has a different layout engine. Mm-hmm. Although we see certain layout engines now being adopted. Like, for example, both Safari and Chrome use a WebKit engine. Okay. Or and pieces the of Gecko that. The Gecko engine is the Mozilla. The Gecko would be for and what is the Opera? Mozilla. Is the Opera is Presto, yes. Presto. Yes. Okay. Okay. And we're about to, um, emerge with a new, new version of that very okay. soon. If we go back to the doc type issue, what happened there is, so in order to be able to make IE run, uh, so that CSS would be more available and more consistent across browsers, um, some people at Microsoft, including Tantek Chalik, who is well known for microformats. And I know that, you know, naming names is always confusing for people, but he, he really deserves some, some credit here, uh, because he had built the Mac version of, of IE prior to that, that what was known as the Tasman engine. Okay. So he took the doc type along with somebody else and they said, look, what we're going to do in IE6 for Windows is we're going to put this in there and we're going to use this as a switching mechanism so that if people use the proper doc type, that will automatically switch the browser, IE6 specifically, Mm -hmm. into the mode where the box model is consistent with other rendering engine box models so that we get a consistent look and feel and are able to use CSS-based layouts consistently. So and the box model is padding, margins, right. things like it's that. It's the so. core model of what we have now in CSS. Okay. Okay, so in order to use CSS well, cascading style sheets well, and get away from the deeply nested table-based layouts of uh, that were causing us certain problems and, you know, in maintenance and oh, hey, accessibility. Oh, hey, I was the king of one-pixel GIFs inside of Oh, me too. Tables. I mean, I, you know, if there was, if there was, you know, a crime against web standards, I've committed it, you know. <laughs> Uh, that's why I think that's also part of evangelism. You get, mm-hmm. you get the religion because yeah. you've done all the mistakes, right? So this is, it's a very complex issue. And it's of course related to how, how browsers now, you know, other browsers adopted that. So now we have this doc type switching and this now puts, um, a lot of, uh, a lot of pressure on the doc type to be something more than it ever was. It is essentially a hack, but it was one that was necessary to advance the web, I think. And that's why I wanted to call out, you know, some people there to, to let, you know, let folks know that, you know, there's some good work that people mm-hmm. have done. Um, but it's also added a layer of confusion for that reason. So it's interesting when we compare the doc types now, we go over to HTML5 and we look at the doc type and the doc type is, is simply angle bracket, uh, um, exclamation point, doc type in lowercase, mm-hmm. HTML. That is the doc type. There's it's no sim- big there's long nothing quote, da, 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 else. It just says the kind of document this is, is an HTML document. That's all it says. And it will flip the doc type switch because. Well, that's it, too simple. How could it, that possibly work? Yeah, it is. It's too simple. <laughs> 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 it's brilliant in some ways, and it's also very controversial. I like it. I saw it. It made sense to me immediately. Mm-hmm. Because when I think of the growth of the web, I think of like a, a cone, like an ice cream cone moving out, right? Like mm-hmm. we are moving out and wider and wider and wider, right? The world wide web, right? So sure. we for, we often forget the world, and we often forget the wide. <laughs> so we just think about the web. And I think we have to think about the width of it and, and the breadth of it and how it's going to grow. And that, to me, is representative of saying it doesn't matter. This is just HTML, okay? So before you had started saying that that HTML5 is turning everything on its ear, that this document-focused model that kind of Tim had originally envisioned, envisioned rather, excuse me, is now really an application-focused model. Yes, and I think that's the inevitable um, you know, thing that the, the buzz about web 2.0 and Ajax and all those technologies at, at mm-hmm. the turn of our uh, time in 2000, 2001, around the, around that time, um, it, it, we really are in the web 2.0 sense without the buzzword, uh, 
a web of application based. It's like we're bringing stuff. X windows to the web now. Yes, like, you know, we are building software. That's yeah. that's I mean, the we're difference. We're really flat out doing that. It's like yes, it's like. Uh, the web, you know, it's like, you know, what was it called? Uh, VT100, you know, and everything was a dumb terminal. And now we have dumb terminals that are dual core <laughs> processors that can do 30. Yeah, you know, it's just right. VT100 except with 720p full HD. That's hysterical. But it's getting, I wouldn't say that quite yet, but it's, it's working toward it. it I mean, is. it's definitely, you know, somebody asked me in a class about HTML5 uh, just last week, you know, why do we need to do this? Can't mm-hmm. we just stop right here? And it's like, no, because where's the fun in that? Right. You when know? can it be done? I think is a good <laughs> question to ask. Can we just be done for a minute? No. Yeah. You know, I just, I can't ever, I mean, and, and that's something I have to say to people that are interested in careers in, in the web. They have to really think about, you know, the fact that nothing is ever the same and they have to be willing to be agile themselves and able to yeah. switch horses midstream. I've described it, um, to, to have a little analogy overload here. I've described it as like when you're a little kid and you're running down the hill, as long as you don't look at your feet, <laughs> you can run really, really fast. And then as soon as you go, Oh um, crap, I'm running way too, ah! Right on your face. And you're yep, dead. Yeah, exactly. That's a good analogy. I like that. That is one. the web. Yeah. Now, I, I profess my ignorance in this, but as I understand it, would you say it is fair to say that the thing that is kind of, I wouldn't say holding HTML5 back, but a point of contention is the codex around the video tag? Oh, I understand that every browser vendor yeah. is putting their weight behind a different, um, Co- compressor decompressor for video. I'm not so sure it's different ve- uh, browser vendors that are the problem. The problem is simply making sure that whatever we end up choosing or, mm-hmm. or whatever, if there's more than one, even better, right? Choice. Right. You know, yeah, of I'm always but about like that. There's like licensing and things. Yes, there's patents. Oh, okay. Patents. It's, a, it's about patents. patents. Yeah. And software, of course, software patents, another really, really hot area where there's going to be rel- religious wars. And mm-hmm. that's what we see. HTML5 in and of itself is highly controversial. There are many things about it. Um, in essence, the, you know, that, that people are not happy with. Um, it is an ongoing issue. It's, mm-hmm. you know, the spec is, is, is going to take time. But what's really interesting is the implementation. And this is my message about HTML5, whether we like it or not. Implementation will trump the specification. If the, if it's in the browser, you know, people are going to use it, right? Yeah. And it is going into, in some form, every single browser. We're all working on it. Opera, mm-hmm. Chrome, of course, is leading the way. Go- yeah. with Google is... But you have to be careful with Google because they call everything HTML5 and sometimes it isn't. Like, okay. you know, like maybe geolocation. Somebody will say a geolocation API. All right, so... Let me step back a second and also mention that H- the other thing to remember about HTML5 is that it's not just a document language. We have new sides to, you know, we have new elements, we have new ways of doing things in the document. Mm-hmm. But the other piece of it, and of course, oh, the other thing is enhanced forms, web forms 2.0. Yeah, I think that people right now are focusing yeah. on the video tag. A lot yeah, of, if but you that ask the average Joe video, on the street, audio, audio, and canvas would be their their focus because right. this is something very new. Um, but we also have to remember that the other side of HTML5 is in fact APIs. It's all about being able to expand uh, through programming and the application programming interfaces what we can do with a browser. Mm-hmm. So um, that's really where the critical shift has has come. Um, so to to get back to the HTML5 as uh, as uh, um, application mm-hmm. based, what's really happening there is that we the whole ideology is that we will be able to create apps and the software the browser, right, right, is the runtime environment. And this is a fascinating kind of concept where, in, in essence, this is a metaphor, but and it may be a bad one, but I like mm-hmm. it anyway because it helps kind of clarify that browsers now are really becoming the .exe or the .app where our applications run, okay? And right. and we have the browser runtime environment, and we really see every single browser le- on board with this, every single browser. Mm-hmm. So when you see buy-in, from the W3C and every single major browser vendor. Yeah. That to me says we got to pay attention. Well, it's it's pretty clear that everyone is trying to push things forward and I know sometimes that people say that like Microsoft's trying to hold things back. I, I some people have said that, uh, some of some of our critics. And uh, I just am watching all of this. I'm not involved in any of those groups, but I found that the recent announcement of Google Chrome Frame Oh, yes. to be a really interesting um it's almost like we're playing thumb war now. I mean, they, they actually use the IE extensibility model to insert the, the, uh, the WebKit based rendering engine inside of the IE Chrome. Right. So Chrome within Chrome. It's, it's very interesting. Yeah, that's, that's you good. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but the thing is, you have to remember, okay, the, Google is calling Frame a plugin. 
I'm not right. so sure it's a plugin. I don't, I, I don't think it's a true plugin because while it is being, you know, something that gets injected, so somebody has to download it, right. uh, and, and deploy it in their IT department or on their local machine if they want that value. Right. The other piece is, is that developers then have to say, in their you documents, do have to opt in. yes, you with have an to. interesting tag that is itself controversial. It's it's meta. It's an XUA compat. The XUA compat stuff is controversial. I don't think in the case of of Frame, it it, it doesn't have anything to do with versioning, which is a whole other right. whole other holy war going on. The, the um, declaration that Google is saying is that. As I understand it, Google Wave is so advanced and so wonderful and yeah, so super duper that, that, that it you needs need this. That. Yes, that's so re- it. basically they're punting on compatibility and standards and just saying we'll run great on our browser. Yeah, it's a radical move, and I'm not sure it's going to work because it takes both opt-in from yeah. the individual or the IT departments, right? And or it also takes the developers knowing how to activate it, but it is a statement, if anything. It is that that you know Google and Google is doing some very interesting work. But do we really want? Um, do we really want one engine? And that's the and question. that's really the question. Do we want one engine? Because even so, let's say I mean, many people have said, even people within IE have stated sometimes mm-hmm. as a, on a sidebar conversation. Well, why don't we just put WebKit or Gecko in and get rid of Trident? Well, of course, Trident is the rendering engine, but everything else, you you know, you have a browser that is tied to OSs, which is part of the problem. It's you know the the, the difficulty with Microsoft, w- the challenge that you have as developers at Microsoft of browsers is that you are unable to to create um, the software as quickly as others because you have to test in every in, in your OS environments. Right. And I think that that's really what what the Chrome Frame thing is about. It's trying to say, Yo, Microsoft, you know, I can inject this right. into it you. Can be done. Yes. And and we also see that. Uh, has happened earlier via um, Dean Edwards did HTC dot HTC, which are our right. Internet Explorer only technologies. And he did JavaScript that basically added, if you would run this library, yeah. it added all the features that weren't in IE6, right? There's actually an interest, there's some interesting work that was being done by the, the DLR team at Microsoft, the dynamic language runtime that would allow you to have a script that would say open script tag type equals uh, text slash Python. Oh, wow. And then we would use Silverlight. We'd bring up an invisible zero by zero Silverlight plugin, like a Flash plugin, but mm-hmm. Silverlight. Then you would take that script, that actual inline script, just instead of JavaScript, it's Python or Ruby, and then drop it into the Silverlight. So the Silverlight provides the engine. It's similar to the Chrome frame idea. Yeah, it's very, it's saying, like injecting another technology. Uh-huh. And it- we're saying, well, we can script the web with JavaScript. Why not script it with Ruby? And then it has full DOM access and you can write client side Ruby code. You're making, you're making me have goosebumps, you know, cause this is, this is, this is the stuff that gets me excited yeah. because we are talking about complex application yeah. development. And I think it's scary also. I mean, I think a lot of people out there in the field are worried. And I want to just say that that's the nature of our beast. And I think that we're going to be fine. You know, the th- the things you're doing today, like my joke yesterday when you said, well, I just, you know, I just built XHTML one strict and I said, XHTML is dead. Yeah, you thanks. Know? <laughs> but it's like, you know, um, it was a joke on my part because XHTML, you can still use it and serve it as text HTML. XHTML yeah. 1.0 strict well, is a perfectly legitimate you know, and language my, for the current web. My ugly Netscape 3, uh, <laughs> you know, it still looks great, right? Sure. They still render. Sure. I can still open text files. So yes, as long as I exactly. have that going for Yes, me. that's what I would I would say. As long as you've got that backward compatibility and you're able to progressively enhance. This is this is how we grow wide. So let me let me ask one last question and and uh, forgive me if this is an inappropriate question, but why do we need Opera? You had said, well, why don't we pick WebKit? Or why don't we pick Gecko? Why don't we pick Presto? I mean, why do we need more choice? Um, well, because you, you know, work for a, Opera, you yes. Pick, you I, I, a I, don't, team. I don't know. I don't know how to answer why do we need Opera because actually it's it's a hard question because it doesn't make lo- logical sense to me. Opera was there very early on. Mm-hmm. Opera started building browser technology before just about anybody. Okay, doing some pretty amazing stuff. I yes. remember early versions of Opera, the yeah. scale, the ability to scale oh, that yeah, we take the, for granted. The zoom. That, the zoom. If you think of a feature, we probably invented it. Probably. That doesn't mean we did it well. Yeah. And we also became the kitchen sink, I think, in a lot of but ways. Why we doesn't just, Opera own the web? Because the desk, because of that on the desktop, we do own the mobile web. Uh, um, that's true. We are, Opera Mini the, is awesome. We, Opera Mini and Opera Mobile, Opera Mobile is, is, um, used on more devices 
in the world than any other browser. So we own that space. And that's where it's, it's interesting to note that Opera comes out of Telenor. So the Norwegian tele, telecommunications network, right? So this is where they started. And so their interest in their location, the Scandinavians, of course, with Ericsson and Nokia and the, the rise of the mobile, the mobile, uh, lifestyle really mm-hmm. came from both Asia and Scandinavia, right? And, and so I think it's only a natural thing. Now, let me just say this. What is interesting about Opera's technology is what is in our core is mm-hmm. what goes in every single device. So the idea is to get the best quality experience on every device. And mm-hmm. so we are device oriented as well as desktop oriented. We have had a big struggle on the desktop. I think there were a lot of reasons that that has happened and far, pr- probably we could talk far, you know, far into the night about that. Um, but we are very much, if you notice, um, there's a lot of activity. I mean, clearly Opera is becoming a sponsor at a major conference in all parts of the world, like, mm-hmm. like here. Uh, we've got a whole evangelical team working on, not on, not necessarily on evangelizing Opera. We have plenty of people doing that, but, uh, but really, if you listen to what people from Opera are talking about, they're talking about about the quality of experience and code and what the web is becoming. And that is what we've always done. We've always been a leader in, in, in innovation. And I think that's what opera it does. Opera mm-hmm. innovates. Opera is the, is the innovator and it's the little engine that could. And I think that we are really, you know, we're really going to um, make a presence on the, on the desktop in the future, um, because of course we have, uh, some wonderful people, well-known, uh, designers have, who have come in to fix the, the problem with the you experience, know, which, the, Chrome. Yeah, the, the Chrome with the Chrome right, experience. The render is fine. It's because the, the rendering is great. The yeah. problem really has been that, that, um, it's a kitchen sink. It There's just Swiss too Army much. Night. Yes, there was just too much. And how do you get your mom to like like that? So yeah. now we have a lovely interface, and I think that's going to help a great deal. Well, very cool. Well, thank you so much, uh, Molly Hostlike, for hanging out with me today and, and uh, chatting about web standards. Thank you so much, Scott. It's been a pleasure. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and I'll see you again next week. <laughs>